the person who's never invested in art before, but wants to diversify a simple portfolio to include what could potentially be the highest performing asset class in their portfolio, but only if it's taken seriously and only if it's marketed correctly. And the thing is, I'm not interested in just having like every single possible artist sign. I mean, I'm interested in that because I'm interested in working with the widest range of artists. But when I go out there and I start to solicit investors, I'm going to be calling the very best art, or what I perceive to be the best art, and I'm going to be offering that up. It's going to be like, you know, hey, this is censor you. <laughs> right, right. I'm censoring the, the art for for the investor. I am because I'm going to say, you know what? I know this girl Betsy Fair. Well, you don't want to waste their time. Yeah, I'm not wasting their time, and I don't want to waste their money. Most importantly, I want them to be able to come back to me in the future with the artwork, and if they want to sell it, I want to be confident that I can move it for them. I'm not trying to sell them something that I feel like, oh, I pulled one over on them. I mean, I'm really wanting to sell them objects that they're going to resell through me later. I'm looking for clients who are not only looking to invest, they're also looking to divest. They're also looking to sell in the future and, and, and capitalize on what they purchased. And so I want to serve all of those interests. But what that requires is that I'm not selling people art that I don't believe is going to have a resale value at some time in the future. Mm -hmm. So I have to be intelligent enough to recognize who those artists are and what the circumstances are going to be under which I'm going to be able to successfully resell their work. And Betsy Barrett is an example of an artist, I believe, that she is in that initial investment tier. The fact of the matter is there are people out there who are making between thirty and eighty thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. <clears throat> who probably have investments in their home and they probably have investments in the stock market and in bonds. But the chances are they don't have any investments in art, in fine art. Yeah, we should have uh, investments we don't. I mean, the thing is, is like, I'll use a Peregrine Honig as an example, right? I'm not, I don't necessarily know that she represents a viable investment. I don't think that her work has quadrupled in value. I don't think that it's hit the resale market yet in, in a sustainable way. But let's say for the sake of argument, you know, she is an artist who is continuing to put her work forward. So she represents at least the type of artist, the dedication that I'm looking for in an individual before I'm going to go to people and say, hey, this is a person that you should take a chance on. Fact is, she has work in the Whitney Museum. I think she has work in the Nerman Museum and the Kemper Museum. Like, she's got work in major museums. People are going to know about her work in the future. The question is, are they going to know about it in a significant and relevant way? Or is it just going to be something that kind of gets lost in the shuffle? That's the risk that the investor takes. Yeah. And that's, it's like investing in penny stocks. See, if you go out there and you buy a Juan Moreau painting for $10 million, it's not going to go down in value it's, because you're buying it for $10 million, right? I mean, it's already established. But when you're, when you're, and, and the same thing is true of buying stock in an AT&T. If you buy AT&T stock, sticker, t uh, you know, uh, ticker symbol T, you're going to get a dividend every quarter for each share that you own. It's going to be like, you know, 38 cents, 45 cents, whatever the dividend is now, I don't know. But, but you know, like, that's an established company. You're paying a premium for that. When you go out there and you look at, a, at an emerging company, you know, like a penny stock company, well, guess what? You're taking a real chance because that company might totally fail. It's not established yet. But if it succeeds, you're looking at what's called a 10-bagger. You're looking at a 1,000% return on your investment, most likely. And I know I know, I know, know a lady in uh, Chicago, right? Her, She's a lawyer. Her husband is a doctor. And uh, they purchased Juan Moreau paintings for like 8000 bucks each back in 1965 or something, right? That was a lot of money to them. It represented a significant investment, but they're worth millions. Like, like the way she puts it, it's the most like intelligent investment they ever made. But then she can show me some other art that she bought during that time from people I don't even know who they are. But she also bought the one Rose. Yeah. And so of all the stuff she bought that did not perform, the Juan Moreau's went from $8,000 to like $18 million. So, you know, obviously, she was, there was, there, like, even though a bunch of the other things that they invested in are totally worthless, mm -hmm. these two objects that they purchased more than compensated. And so I would love to be the guy who sold her the Juan Moreau 20, 30 years mm -hmm. ago and then gets to resell mm -hmm. and make a commission on that. 
And so that's my that's my role as a professional. That's the service that I want to offer to artists and to investors. Sounds like you have a business plan. Yeah, I have a business. Yeah, and it's all <coughs> ironed out. You know, huh? what's that? I know she was been bored all night. She <laughs> went to eat though. Where do you want to eat? This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Where do you want to eat? You know, I'm I'm fine. I'm actually kind of tired. I have to get up in the early. Uh oh. I mean, that's my only this this full time. 40 hour a week gig is new to me. <laughs> what time are you getting up? I get up usually around 6.30. Mm -hmm. That's early. Yeah, I know. My chicken. My rooster. My rooster dictates. Oh, he has, a, he has a rooster. I have a, yeah. I have a little miniature rooster. Ready? This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to that. You want to do Town Toxic? Sure. Terrorist contraception pill discovered to be dropped as bombs on Pakistan, used experimentally in New York. Hmm? Perennial disappointment, the candor of the participants leads me to suspect rebellion is no, in the air. Like, yeah. Remember, you may have to be a prostitute, but you don't have to smell like one. Which brings us to the exciting <laughs> part of today's episode. Train wreck caused by text messaging promotes salvation for migrant workers. Details at 11. The bailout plan went through effortlessly, which is hard to fathom given that it is the world's largest ever penis inserting itself into my emaciated, poverty-stricken ass. Rammed right in there! Well, Whoa. maybe that ass has been reamed more than once and was prepared for this. America is the greatest nation. We the people can take anything up our ass. And we'll even smile while taking it. Our founding fathers would be so hard right now. Throbbing. Which brings us to tonight's riddle. What is big and hard and throbbing and sticking in your ass? Tune in next month on Erection Day to find out. And in other news, people just like you are taken advantage of by people who couldn't care less. More at 11. Many educated people out there look down on average Americans as smelly, unrestrained, unintelligent wasters. But don't let that get you down. No. Let other things get you down instead. Things like war, poverty, and sexually transmitted disease. Why not? Seriously, there's nothing wrong with using your depression as an excuse to transmit your disease to someone less suspecting. That is how the bankers got the people to bail out the stock market, so you should use the same strategies. There's nothing wrong with that, and don't you ever let anyone tell you there is. Ever. The free market is bully pulpit gone wrong, as Garth Brooks might say to his homosexual lover while making gay porn. <laughs> that is the height of anarchism. Garth Brooks making a porn while acting out the bailout plan with his lover. Stick it in there! I can hear him say with his sexy Oklahoma accent. Get to the heart of the problem! <laughs> yeah, I need an injection of capital year right there! Thomas Jefferson is masturbating in his grave right now just thinking about it. The thunder of his jizz bombs can be heard echoing off the walls of his coffin. Nothing is worth freaking out over, because it's all we have left to eat. Nothing. Nada. Zip. Zero. We can fuck and we can breathe and we can drink our own urine. All of these options are better than living in Lee's Summit, working at an ammunition plant, and stealing away at night to masturbate the child porn while remembering what life was like before you were raped by your uncle. Your Uncle Sam touched you where, I can hear the defense attorney asking you. The attorney then turns to the jury and says, See, it was all a lie. Ramming a big throbbing cock up this person's ass was not improper touching. It was a rescue plan. <laughs> Chalk it up to learning. Again. Today we learn how to let go of our inhibitions and offer up our barely legal tender assets to uncle. I regret that I have but one anus to give to my country, so I will have to appropriate your anus also. I'm sure you won't mind. After all, in the big rock-scissors-papers game, I have guns and I see that you chose tissue paper ideals. Turns out guns beat ideals every time. Forever and ever and ever. Details at 11. J.W. Hulkenberg is a financial analyst for Goldman Sachs and author of a new book, Ass Rape as Cure for Monetary Constipation, The Politics of Domination. Yeah. So YouTube, you know, has permitted this new kind of unfettered access to op-ed that, that's never really existed before. Well, was it you that was asking me about public access? Yes. Well, 
I, um, I fought a little bit of the public access battle in the early 90s and lost, of course. And it's amazing how things can be written down. This is the way they're going to be. And then there are loopholes that are found. And then the loopholes are solidified by people's apathy. As you know, I said before, my history was that I had this public access channel that showed local bands. Worked fine until the guy that was permitting me to do it retired from the company in Warrensburg. And then the uh, uh, put into power a new people who were in who uh, didn't want to have to deal with me, so they let some crackpot lady turn into like a thousand concerned citizens in Warrensburg to get me off the air. And uh, of course, you know, I relied on the wrong people to help back me up and support me, which was uh, some of the youth in Warrensburg. They could care less. Right. What was even more damning about that whole situation was a little bit of scenester politics. I found out that one of the bands in town, one of the members of the band, went around telling, uh, this is a demonstration of uh, came back to me one time and said that one of the bands that I shot in Lawrence, Kansas, wanted to sue me for putting it on the public access channel. And I found out later that that was a complete and total lie. And um, you can imagine that, like, uh, you know, what would somebody have to gain by doing that, by, by discouraging me from doing something that's, you know, good for the community, you know, promoting local music? Well, it's jealousy, as always. This is a demonstration of <coughs> No, yeah, that's totally true. And it, it's kind of a bummer to have to deal with people who... I eventually resent you for the yeah, game. success. Yeah, yeah, success that you have. It's just yeah, I eventually uh, didn't deal with them. I um, I wrote them out and wrote every one of it, that person's friends who acted just like him out of my life. I quit talking to them. And that was amazing too because when I stopped talking to those people, they were like going around saying, "What's wrong with him? What? Why didn't he want to talk to us?" And uh, one of my friends was still hanging out with them and stuff. And one of the um, one of the people in that group came up to him, up to him, right in front of me, and said, "Hey, Drew, why don't you hang out with the cool people anymore?" <laughs> and ever since then, we we both made an inside joke out of that. It's like, oh, you're not hanging out with the cool people, huh? <laughs> There's so many. I mean, that's like one of the things that I'm constantly evaluating about my life is that the familiar is comfortable. Mm -hmm. The unfamiliar, in many cases, may contain more opportunity. I mean, once it's familiar, it's kind of exhausted itself. And yeah, I had that situation recently with YJs. Um, both Suyan and I have gotten tired of uh, one of the baristas in there who's essentially ruining that business single-handedly. You know, she's so cool and all her friends are so cool that she could get away with giving people good paying customers less product and make them pay more for it and she thinks she's getting away with it and it's like we know immediately when she's giving us a thinner slice of pie you know right. now maybe everybody else is giving us more product than we deserve and she's just giving us the right amount but you know her attitude also says otherwise she's uh, you know I, I had a couple of light conversations with her where she essentially said that her and her kind of people are special and different than everybody else. And I'm like, what? Hipsters? What are you talking about? You know? People with tattoos on their bodies? I don't know. What are you talking about? <laughs> right. Like, I